My Lords, in congratulating today's maiden speakers and thanking the redoubtable Baroness Goldie for her extraordinary service to your Lordship's House, may I also join those in the collective sigh of relief that the noble Lord, Lord Armand of Wimbledon, remains in his post. My Lords, I draw attention to several relevant all-party parliamentary groups with which I am involved and I am a patron of Hong Kong Watch. December the 9th and 10th will mark the 75th anniversaries of the Convention on the Crime of Genocide and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Along with the creation of the United Nations, it was architecture for the rule of law and a valiant attempt to avert another world war. 75 years later, in the context of the Middle East and Ukraine, and an axis of dictators led by Xi, Putin, <coughs> Kim, and Khomeini, I hope that our new Foreign Secretary, the soon-to-be Lord Cameron, will see the collective threat that they represent. And in particular, I hope that he will reassess his golden era policies on China, read the excellent report of your Lordship's House, the Select Committee on International <coughs> Relations and Defence Committee, the report entitled China, Trade and Security, and frame his engagement and trade deals against the threats and the new realities of genocide in Xinjiang, the destruction of democracy in Hong Kong, the daily threats to Taiwan, and the egregious violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and international law, particularly the 1951 Convention on Refugees. During the debate here on October the 19th on the report on China from the Intelligence and Security Committee, I set out my own concerns at some length. That committee drew our attention to the new Foreign Secretary's role in the £1 billion China-UK investment fund, which the committee said, their words, could be in some part engineered by the Chinese state to lend credibility to Chinese investment. The Foreign Secretary will need to reflect on that and on the role in, that he's played in the vast Colombo port city in Sri Lanka, mm. a signature project for Xi Jinping's Belt and Road initiatives, which, as Sir Ian Duncan Smith has rightly pointed out, may one day act as a Chinese military outpost in the Indo-Pacific. China has used its Belt and Road program to indebt nations and to require recipient vassal states to do its bidding in the United Nations institutions and agencies. Belt and Road has a combined GDP amounting to trillions of pounds, touching 151 countries with a population of over 5 billion people. That, at a moment when the UK has cut its development aid by a total of £7 billion since 2019, with 29% of the remaining budget being used to host refugees. This, as we neglect the links to the 2.4 billion people of the Commonwealth spread across some 56 countries. While that has been going on, the CCP has literally been marching into the void. Xi's latest extension of Belt and Road is to create a global initiative on artificial intelligence, ominous because of the precedent using facial recognition technology in Xinjiang's surveillance state. AI is a tool which the CCP will share with other authoritarian states enabling them to impose iron fist control of their citizens. So I particularly applaud the initiative which the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has taken in trying to get a global response to this. But doubtless, my Lords, this will aid and abet spying with Chinese characteristics, even here in the heart of our democracy. And I would draw the attention of the House to yesterday's report of the £150 million which has been received by UK universities, some with direct military links to China and some of it subject, I might add, to US sanctions. What are we thinking of? My Lords, the CCP regime spies, it subverts, it infiltrates, it manipulates and buys votes in the General Assembly. And, of course, it also sanctions UK parliamentarians, I declare an interest. It's disgraceful that the CCP blocks Taiwan from membership of the WHO, which it's used to cover its COVID tracks. And for the avoidance of doubt, it would be helpful today if the Noble Lord, the Minister, Lord Ahmed, could reaffirm the government's position on Taiwan in line with the recent G7 statements. It's risible 
that the CCP regime sits on the United Nations Human Rights Council while being in breach of UDHR Articles 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 14, 18 and 19 and others as well. It's like putting the fox in charge of the hen coup. Last night, I met Tibetan Buddhists who are grievously persecuted. There are Christians in prison, Falun Gong practitioners subject to forced organ harvesting, while Uyghur Muslims suffer genocide. In the face of this, the UN is a hollow man. The noble Lord Lord Swire, who spoke a moment ago, has previously raised, as I have done, the repatriation of North Koreans by China to a state that the United Nations has described uh, as without parallel and is accused through one of its own inquiries of crimes against humanity. Next week, the President of the Republic of Korea, uh, Yoon Suk Yeol, will be a welcome visitor here. They are willing to resettle every one of those refugees in the Republic of Korea. And as for the Uyghurs, in 2021, the House of Commons determined that genocide is being committed. In response, China ensured that compliant states at the UN Human Rights Council rejected a motion to even debate the findings of the UN Special Rapporteur. In the face of all this, my lords, it is urgent that we return to the founding principles of the UN and reform it in the way that my noble friend Lord Hanny described in his speech earlier on, strengthen our hard and soft power alliances and be much clearer eyed about the threat posed by the CCP regime in China. Yeah. Yeah.